here I am. I'm so happy to be here. Um, first of all, I, I do run Frontline, which means that we um, do a ton of linear documentaries, which I think most of you have probably seen on television and also streaming. And about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, we started to do 360 work and increasingly are doing VR work with Nani and Jamie and the emblematic group. Um, and it's been an extraordinary experience and um, none of it would be possible without Knight's funding to make that possible because PBS actually has not yet funded VR, but, but they will, mark my word. This will, they will come along because it's some of the most um, compelling and remarkable work out there. Um, I am so thrilled to be with you guys. Thank you for both being here and I'm glad to be moderating on a special day for Nani, which is amazing to be here and celebrate you. Um, but I, I wanna just share a couple of personal experiences with your work, both of your work. Um, it was fortunate that you're both here because um, beyond Nani's work, these two pieces really resonated with me. And I don't think Hal or anyone at night knew that particularly. It just happens to be true. So I'll share a couple of stories. The um, Notes on Blindness was one of the most uh, remarkable pieces for me personally because it helped me understand how you could do something so counterintuitive, right, talking about blindness in a visual space. And because I am not an audio person, I'm really visual, it helped me understand audio and actually helped me appreciate how much more we need to pay attention to that, especially in the 3D and the, the VR space. Um, and it was really remarkable. The other thing I will tell you is that I do run Frontline, but I have a business guy. And this business guy is tough, right? I don't look that tough. I am, but I'm not that tough. So I have a tough guy who does our business, and he didn't know that I loved this film, but he saw it a few weeks ago, and he came into my office crying, and he said to me, have you seen this? I, I just, I can't even believe it. I, I just, I, you've been talking about this VR thing, and I finally understand it. And so for him to cry, frankly, you don't know him, but he's, he's a tough guy, um, was really quite something. Uh, and it, it really helped me, actually, um, with my frontline staff to have them understand this form. The same was true for your film, um, Witness. We had this great event about a year ago now with Nani and her colleagues at um, Columbia, actually, another Tau event, where we sat together with a lot of our traditional filmmakers, people who are really well along in their careers, um, and we decided to bring them inside the conversation about VR as opposed to what a lot of news organizations do with um, more veteran types, is they don't include them in innovation, so they don't buy into it, so I've been doing the opposite with our filmmakers. And when they saw your piece, they suddenly understood, okay, we, we understand what we could do here. We, we finally started to get it. So thank you for being here um, and for sharing your stories. So I'll start, Amory, with you, if you don't mind. I, I wanna understand how you made such a counterintuitive decision to do a piece that's so visual in VR about blindness. Uh, you hear me well? Yeah, oh, it's, it's here. Uh, I think VR chose us rather than the inverse. <laughs> we, we started this uh, idea. Um, th the story of John Hull is, a, is a, a quite a compelling story. He uh, lost sight at the age of 45, and he, he kept a diary, a tape diary, an audio diary, uh, recording his thoughts. It was kind of autotherapy for him. Uh, to understand what he was going through because it, it's quite tough. If you lose sight at the age of 40, 45, it, it's quite intense. Uh, so we were driven by, by this testimony and we thought, okay, let's try to build an interactive audio podcast uh, because we, we saw uh, serial and we saw things that were working. And we said, yeah, we, we're going to do like that. And because it's for um, to explain a story about someone going blind, we're not going to use visuals. But very quickly, we realized that we were missing the whole point of the thing. Uh, John, uh, John is talking a lot about how to bring the two communities together, sighted and unsighted people. And by doing only a, a purely audio work, we were losing most of the uh, audience. So we, s we realized that it was not the correct way of uh, approaching the project. So we switched and we said, OK, we're going to construct visuals. But rather than um, showing things, we're going to try to give people a sense of what John's brain is doing when he's analyzing the soundscapes. Like you hear things and how do you, does your brain interpret that there's someone talking there, there's a fan here and some noises over there. 
So that was the starting point. And we put in place a few um, uh, like um, interac uh, interaction things. Like we would look for sounds in the, in the visual uh, space we were constructing. So first we were using phones and we were exploring the space like this. So basically we were constructing a 3D world with a 3D audio. And at some point we realized, okay, we're constructing a whole world. We want to give you to see what his brain is trying to reconstruct but probably we should try VR. I mean, VR is uh, cutting everything around so we can reprogram all the visuals and all of the audio. So that, that's how we came to VR. We really came this way. And we, we, when we started the project, we never said, yeah, it's gonna be VR, no. It really, it really came along the way to be faithful to the story we we're trying to uh, tell and, and also to, the, to John Hull's work uh, that was really to bring closer the communities. So and we you're, you're a sound designer, right? So did you did you come to it with this idea that you really wanted people to be immersed so they're hearing it the, the audio is so sophisticated. So it's almost did you did you frame it first in audio or how did you come how did you come up with the idea that in this space audio was so essential? I mean, I think we all know that now, but but what what was that sort of idea that you had for us to to listen so acutely in that space? Uh, yeah, I've been a sound designer, uh, like I'm no longer a sound designer now uh, since 10 years or something, but I've been a sound designer for uh, yeah, almost 10 years or so before. Uh, so um, really I had a lot of experience in building interactive acoustic space and that's, uh, I used this experience to um, build every scene starting from the audio. Because we had the tapes, we had the voice of John, we kind of constructed the whole audio world and we selected also in the narration in what he's uh, saying. We, we uh, isolated some moments where we, con we could construct uh, some very precise auditory scenes. So we started with audio and we tried to create for each scene, we tried to create a kind of ramp up in terms of uh, audio and storytelling. So really that what started the uh, the, the process was really this way. We started to build audio worlds and then the visualization. And we had to uh, custom develop also some uh, visualization algorithms so that actually the audio triggers the visuals, which is the, usually it's the inverse. So in Noton Blindness you have, when the sound is playing, the, we analyze the sound and this is what um, make things appear. This is directly uh, controlling the lights and everything in the scene. So. That's, uh, that's, yeah, and I think that the, the sound design, the interactive sound design experience was very helpful to uh, approach the scene this way. So, so Darren, I want to ask you a similar question. I'll just, I'll just sort of turn it on, on its face. We talked earlier about how you talked about a, a, you know, an incident of terror, you know, told through a character portrait, the portrait of a person, right, and their experiences. Very different with what you see, sort of, with this massive amount of images that we see right now. Um, so, talk about your character first approach, but then also why it, why did you go VR in this way? What, what sort of drew you to that? I think um, w when, we, when we were making the film, we were coming up to the 10 year anniversary of um, the 7 7 attack in London. And uh, so there was a lot about it in the news. And, and, and you know, as you, as you mentioned, you get flooded with kind of different news media and Facebook and, and how we sort of basically process uh, news and current affairs these days. Um, and I, I knew I wanted to make a film in, in 360 and VR, and I knew that this could be an interesting sort of subject matter to do it around, uh, to really kind of reframe that story uh, through, through the eyes of this one person. And so really it, was, it, was, it started off more as, as, as an exercise in research and finding the right person that I kind of really connected with. And uh, just like uh, Notes of Blindness, it, it started very much as a... Um, recording the audio first. So, so the interviews were done first and we constructed the narrative from that. And Jackie, her name was Jackie, Jackie Putnam, she was so good at telling her story. She, she had a very visual way of, of speaking. Uh, she, she was quite dramatic in the way that she, and she was a writer as well. So she had written, over the last 10 years, she, she had written a lot about uh, the events of, those day, of that day and also the 10 years afterwards and, and her recovery from PTSD and, and uh, the flashbacks that she had suffered. And, and so it kind of lent itself kind of to create a visual world around it. 
And you know, one of the first things that she says that kind of struck me was, she said, you don't live in the same world that I do. You don't see the same things that I see. And that immediately struck me as, as, as what I was trying to do was create a world. So it, as opposed to you know, filmmaking, uh, traditionally, we are sort of kind of using the frames and, and 16.9 and stuff like that. Whereas obviously in 316 virtual reality, we're, we're trying to create a, an all-encompassing world. And I wanted to bring the audience into that world. And so that was very much a kind of driving uh, reason for doing it. But also, also to try and use VR to, to really represent what was an internal world as much as it was sort of being uh, on the platform in King's Cross. It's, the film is really much more about her emotional journey as it is a reconstruction of, those, of the events of that day. Were you frustrated by the form as you were trying to construct it? Because I know, you know, we tried to do the Storm Sandy VR experience, and it was so hard for us because, you know, we wanted to do the typical find the archive, but of course the archive's never in 360. So then we superimposed it on these other shots, and then I got, a, you know, our editor involved, and he was complaining that it looked real, too real. So we had this whole discussion about how do you evoke something that's in the past? There's a lot of the stories that we tell are thoughtful, right? So you're you're thoughtfully thinking about it journalistically. So how did you feel making it? Were you it, it, was, it was incredibly or? frustrating. I mean, it, it, was, it was the first thing that I'd made in, uh, in VR in 360. So constantly making it, you're, you're, you're constantly catching yourself, thinking, oh, I can do this, or I see this image, but then figuring out that you actually you can't do that. It's much, you've got to think about everything else, which is, you know, a very, so kind of, I guess, kind of basic. but but. I think one of the main considerations was what do we do when the bomb goes off, you know? And, and so the first half of the film is, is really a reconstruction in the sense that you're on the same platform she was on at the same time of day. We get on the same train, it's going in the same direction, and the bomb, the effect of the bomb going off happens at the exact point where it did. But from that point onwards, it was, it was really a question of where do we go with this now? And uh, and so we decided to go internal, as I kind of mentioned, and, 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 and use abstract imagery so that really you're left with her voice more than anything. And, and the images that she conjures uh, with her testimony and, that, and that, pairing that with sort of interesting visuals that we have, like we use kind of light effects and uh, we take you into, it, into an environment which is very different to the environment of being in a tunnel. Um, but it has echoes and symbolism of, of, of old tra disused train tracks and stuff like that, allowed us to kind of keep in that journey uh, of her getting out of the tunnel, but, but make it sort of, uh, make it less intense. You know, I didn't want to, I, I actually, I didn't want to put people in a situation where they would feel completely uncomfortable about, you know, what they were, what they were about to see. Or, so you're kind of left with her descriptions are more powerful. And even her descriptions, she doesn't go into detail, she, you know, of certain elements. You can just hear it in her voice, and that, and that, and that in a way, is enough. Were you surprised it resonated so much? I'm just curious. I mean, it's a frustrating process. You're, you're making it for the first time. Were you, were, you, were you surprised by the response? I think so, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think back. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm constantly surprised about the response to, to that film, because it was made, it was made in, by ourselves. So it wasn't commissioned. We just kind of, as, as a small independent production company, we just decided that this was something we wanted to do. Um, it, was, it, it was done, not quickly, but it was done on limited resources. Uh, and um, and, and you know, I, I think the response of it has been sort of overwhelming in a sense. I think a lot of that is to do with Jackie herself. I think you know, she, she was a great contributor. And at the end of the day, when you're trying to tell a story, if you have somebody at the, at the central to that who's, who's great at telling her own story, then that obviously makes it uh, a lot easier. The same with, you know, obviously John Hall as well. I, I don't know. I, I would say, though, that if that was a linear film, right, a digital video film, or it was, yeah, it just, I'm just saying you're being modest. That's okay. No, but I think it's actually something about the form, right? So I, I think what we learned from your piece and also from your piece, Amory, is that th there is this form actually suits a certain a certain storytelling method quite well right now, right? It's gonna expand and we're gonna learn how to tell other kinds of stories, but um, my contemplation on why it works so well and why it was so extraordinary is you were actually inside her world. 
as opposed to linear where you're watching it and it feels pretty remote from you. If you haven't seen it, you really should watch this piece because you feel completely inside her. The same thing is true and why, you know, Jim, my business guy, cries is because you feel like, oh my God, you could be blind. And you could watch a linear film and you would feel, you'd learn a lot about being blind, but you certainly wouldn't feel blind. And so, um, not to get too too you know new agey on it, it is there is an experience that happens, right? That that is unusual in that capacity inside VR that that played well for that story. Absolutely. Well, it, you know, it's it's there's an intensity of feeling, and I think you know you don't really see Jack. You see Jackie twice in the film, once at the beginning, uh, and and then again at the end. And when you see her again at the end. Most people react very emotionally to that because they feel very connected to her. Uh, they've, they've been on that journey with her. They, they, they've kind of really entered into what I feel is kind of like her soul, you know, the, the things that really kind of drive her as a person. And then when you see her again, and, and at the end of the film, she, she, she's standing outside King's Cross in the rain, and she turns, and there was a different ending, actually, but we reshot it because it that ending was better. But um, she turns... She turns around and she, and she walks, walks off into, into, uh, down into the tube and kind of rejoins the masses, rejoins the world. And, and so people have felt very connected to that. And I think it's just, I think the duration, it's, it's a long film. And I think that was important as well to keep you in that experience for uh, 13 minutes. I know that, you know, your films, it, it, it's between 15 to 20 minutes because it's interactive. So, so I saw your piece at MIT, um, and uh, the line was long, and it was well, what an extraordinary thing to watch people actually stay for the entire time, and nobody took off their goggles ever. I, I wanted to ask you, did you um, actually, when you were building it for VR finally, when you, when you settled on that, were you thinking about a certain way to share it with people? Were you thinking about... Oculus, like this is this is a bit of time ago. So, how are you even knowing to build it properly in that sense? Like, what were you thinking about? Mm, actually, we we're quite scared by, by yeah, that. Yeah, it's scary, uh, right? We we really didn't know exactly uh, where we were going. I mean, th there's the story of John. There's his uh, uh, phrasing, his voice. That's really incredible. So we really were scared of turning this very beautiful uh, narration and story into something that was gadgety and you know not working correctly that that was a big scare uh, when we were sure vr was really good for what we wanted to do we were not sure who would watch this what would be the distribution scheme or and even today that's a question that's still quite open uh, uh, <laughs> but i don't know at some point the the i think it, it co goes back to your uh, question before also. Uh, VR is really a lot about experiencing yourself rather than watching something. You know, I, I usually make this comparison where you can actually watch a documentary on free fall and you're going to say, oh, those guys are crazy and they do it. But you can actually experience free fall, which is a very different thing. Because at some point, your brain needs to say, OK, I'm going to jump in the void. <laughs> and this is very weird. If you never did that, Try to do it once. <laughs> you really have to switch your brain and say, OK, you're going to jump in the void. Uh, so I think VR is really helpful for that, because you can really turn your mind into a different state where you say, OK, I'm not watching something that's a bit connected. No, I'm actually living it and experiencing it. And if the visuals and the, the, the audio and the interaction, if everything is correctly put together, it doesn't have to be realistic, but if it's correctly working together, then your brain is going to be, uh, OK, it's going to say, yeah, I know this is not real. I know I'm not really there, but it's coherent enough that I want to be there. And you're going to feel things. And that's when it's becoming interesting. And that's really what drives the experience, I think. And when we developed the project, we really tried to not make you feel like you're John Hull, but rather share a bit of his experience and you know actually feel some frustration at some point and that's why in the first chapter we we kind of have everything that disappears because there's no more s any sounds playing so suddenly we shut all the visuals because we want you to be frustrated we want you to ex actually experience this loss of something so and that vr for effective. that is really and through the whole process we actually haven't really thought about distribution <laughs> But maybe that's also because uh, it was uh, a kind of 
uh, funded in a very French way, where... <laughs> I love the French way. It's just an awesome way to fund things. <laughs> We, we had, um, like, yeah, we probably had two-thirds of the production uh, budget through uh, separate phase, but we had them as we were building the project. So um, there was no question of making it um, profitable. So this, we knew, we, we found a, a kind of correct way of telling his story. But we were not sure it was uh, it would be distributed correctly. So it really we, we made it along the way. So I know there was a linear film. There was a traditional film with it as well, right? So how how is what was your relationship like to that project, and and what was the relationship like after it was released? And I'm just curious, you know. So, um, to to very shortly uh, the. Uh, in 2012, the two English directors, Peter uh, and James, Peter Middleton and James Pinet, they, uh, they met in 2010, actually. They met John Hull, and they learned about his story, and then they released a short uh, movie, a uh, 10 minutes short, that was selected in the New York uh, Updocs, and it was a 10 minutes short. And after that, the, the French TV, uh, French-German TV channel Arte, really liked the short and said, okay, we're gonna help you produce a feature and we'd like to have an interactive part. So the both projects kind of started uh, together. Then the film went really fast and we went really slow. <laughs> but eventually- In the case, they the went VR takes so much longer, it's yeah. amazing. <laughs> but eventually uh, they went slow at the ending and we went fast at the, uh, uh, at the ending. So we kind of made it, but we we shared if, uh, we shared the, the material like the, the recordings the tapes the voice of John is really the same in uh, it's the same uh, raw material we shared also a vision of um, what's the legacy of John Hell and what was the message behind and we had a few conversations with the English directors and then we had really two different productions running in parallel parallel we we never really had. Um, uh, prepared connections between the, the feature and the, so it was two uh, productions with a common mat raw material, a common uh, vision, but no um, uh, direct production exchange, let's say. Fascinating, especially when I think about it for Frontline because we're doing so many linear projects, so how you then start to do VR related to them, is it's complicated. It's, it's probably wise to have two teams Right, in, in very dangerous places that we go, it's often hard to send in two teams. So it's a different scenario a lot of the time. And it's good, I think, if you share the vision, but not necessarily share too example. much. Because right, if you share right. too much, you're going to end up with things that are going to be right. probably too mixed. So, um, Darren, tell us hmm. about your newest project. And then I just want to encourage you guys all to make sure that you watch these projects. So if you haven't, please take the time because it's one thing to talk about VR, it's another thing to watch it. It's completely different. So tell us about your experience, your your next one, and then yeah, I'm going to sure. open to questions. Sure. Um, so, uh, well, the film was originally called Invisible and was uh, commissioned by uh, Sheffield Doc Fest. Uh, it won their first ever VR commission, which was great. Um, which, uh, which meant that we had to make it in time to premiere at Sheffield, which uh, we really had a few months to do it. Deadlines are good. Deadlines, <laughs> but yeah. But um, it's about uh, indefinite detention in the UK immigration system, um, it, which, is, which boils down to really ba basically people that are claiming asylum or have overstayed their visa in the UK or, or have family in the UK and are trying to uh, gain citizenship. Uh, being placed in detention centres, uh, and and the UK is the only country in uh, in the EU that has not signed up to something called the Returns Directive. The Returns Directive, uh, well, because they haven't signed up to it, there, there is no time limit on the amount of time that they can be spent in detention. Now this means that we have there are cases of a lot of people that have, have been in detention for a long time, uh, and so the film deals with. Basically, an experience told through uh, six different contributors who all sort of take a different part of the journey from arriving in the UK, being placed into a detention center. Uh, basically, there's lots of different vignettes. And it's, so it's arriving, um, the mental anguish of being it, it, 
detained indefinitely. Uh, there's a section about self-harm. Uh, then uh, there is a section about the bureaucracy involved to basically fight your case against the Home Office whilst being locked up with no internet access and your phone being taken, lots and lots of things like that. And then there's being released and out on bail but being tagged. And, and really the, the film is uh, different in the, in the sense to Witness 360 in terms, of, in terms of the idea of distribution, I think going back to that, Witness 360 we didn't have a plan with. We knew that we wanted to enter it into film festivals and at that time it didn't really feel like there was a way of distributing it. Uh, with, uh, Indefinite or invisible? Invisible. It's called indefinite on the New York New York Times. We're announcing yeah, it. Indefinite. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, what I, with this film, it's 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 very much there is uh, definitely a, it's about activism. It's a, you know we wanted to, to let people know about this, so it meant we needed to get it out to a wider audience, and uh, and and so luckily enough, the New York Times have come on board and have put it on. So we're, I'm very very proud about that. And we do have a little clip if people wanted to see. Why don't, why, don't we watch, why don't we watch a minute of that and then a minute of yours, and then we're going to open it to questions. Will you do that? Okay. I came to this country to seek safety. I'm originally from Sri Lanka. I'm here to save my life. I'm victim of I would like to sort of shed a light onto an important issue that majority of people are not aware of, and that's indefinite detention. Play, it, it didn't stream very well off the internet there, but um, yeah, you well, get the idea. It's always hard to do 2D trailers, we found, of 3D and VR <laughs> work. <laughs> but that's a pretty good one. At least the opening really worked and was dramatic. Cool. Um, okay, and Amory, let's watch at least a minute of this. And this will definitely tease you guys to watch both of, the, both of these experiences. This is cassette one, track one, notes on blindness. Sitting in the park with the children, I hear the footsteps of people walking past me, rustling of the newspaper, murmur of conversation. The myriad voices and sounds create a panorama of music and information. Where there is no activity, there's no sound, and then that part of the world dies. The earliest experience of panic took place in the middle of December. I left the house, but had only gone about a hundred yards when I was aware of a growing feeling of doubt and uncertainty, as if I was banging my head, my whole body against the wall of blindness. Things which once one took for granted, then tried desperately to compensate for, in the end, ceased to matter. I think I am beginning to understand what it's like to be blind. That's great. Thank you, Amelie. Thank you, Darren. We, 
we have some time for questions. So these guys are right here, ready for anything. Hi, I saw your um, notes on blindness, blindness quite a while ago, and I was curious, I have two questions for each of you actually. For the notes on blindness, in order to plan this out, because it is so audio heavy, did you storyboard it? Did you use the diary entries as your storyboard? And then how did you edit your audio to sort of match up or sweeten it up? The, it was a quite long process. We, we started from the transcriptions. We listened to all of the tapes. And then we start, started from the written transcriptions. There, there's like 300 pages of transcription. And we isolated like 30 moments where we thought we could build scenes, chapters, uh, let's say. From those uh, chapters, we then selected 10 of them to have a complete narrative arc from you know, discovery of blindness, which is almost a kind of uh, a phase where he's a bit excited to discover a new per perceptive world. Then he falls into depression, and then there's the final uh, acceptance. So we tried to uh, isolate. 10 chapters that would have this complete narrative arc. And then each of the scene, we uh, edited his voice so that we had a kind of um, the, the message of each chapter. Like the first chapter is really to tell you how to listen to things and how his perception uh, changed. So we kind of edited and um, mounted the audio of his text to have a rough uh, idea of the, 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 what we wanted to say in this chapter. And then what we did is really we built 3D realistic audio world in the sense that we're not, it's not linear audio world, it's objects that have behaviors, like there's a dog, there's the, the car park, and there's stuff. And you, you could run the scene for one hour and it, it would stay, it would work well because it's, uh, because it's all computed in real time. It's uh, really more be w sound behaviors uh, rather than uh, just a, a linear timeline. So they, all the sounds are placed in the 3D space. So they, uh, it's not um, a prepared ambience, if you say. The, the dog barks sometimes. Sometimes he's going to bark three times in a row, and then he's not going to bark. And I can't tell you when he's going to bark. <laughs> so each time you play the experience, it's changing a bit. So. Uh, and for the first chapter, because we didn't want to have people to be overwhelmed at the beginning by too many things, we started very gradually. And th that's directly coming from the, the past experience I had working on video games, where you, you kind of learn how to create realistic, interactive uh, um, scenes. And that's why we, we did very gradually like that, until there's the climax at the end where we kind of shut down everything. So it's, we're trying to learn, uh, to have people learn the language in the first chapter. So that's how we build the ambiences. And all of the ambiences of all the chapters are built the same way. There's, there's like, uh, in heavy scenes, uh, there's like 40 to 50 sounds playing, ob sound objects, playing individually with their own behaviors, which is quite heavy uh, because it's all binauralized in real time and it's running on cell phones. At the beginning, we couldn't have any visuals <laughs> because the cell phones were kind of burning. So we had to uh, optimize a lot and, and be able to get some CPU back to have the visuals running at the same time also. But that's how we construct the scenes. But really, it started from this first this narrative arc and then the mini narrative arc of each chapter. That's what drives the construction of the audio uh, behind. I, I, does that answer the question? Yeah. Oh, you had a second question. Oh, we should have a second question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a Actually, you kind of segued into my second question, which was for Darren also. <clears throat> With your witness um, piece, how did you, how were you able to do that without making it feel like the person or the viewer was was going to be on, on sort of like a video game kind of a feel because it is sort of like a real um, experiential kind of journey. But at the same time, how do you avoid the disconnect or the desensitization when it comes to something like that? Because another 
thing that brought to my mind was that the movie out right now, Patriots Day, where they sort of reenact the Boston Marathon bombing. Yeah. Um, so how, when you're in a VR setting, how do you separate that where it's actually you're getting empathy versus I'm just checking out this VR experience? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, well, I, I think, you know, I, I think really it's about, for me, that that film was really about sort of building her world, how she saw the world. So, it, it, so, so you're, it, it's less about sort of reconstruction, reconstruction of, an, of an event as about her point of view on, on the world in which she lives in. And so she's very pointed about that. So, you know, already right from the off, you're sort of kind of putting your viewer in a, in a position to say, okay, we're going to show you stuff that you might have already seen before. So, you know, obviously people that have watched it in the UK or, go on, or, or in London, like go on the tube all the time or the subway here, you know, and there is that sense of anticipation, yes, about, okay, I know a bomb's going to go off at some point. But what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do with that film is to really say uh, this woman has experienced something and she sees the world in a different way. And, and therefore, you kind of get involved in that. And you get involved in the things that are important to her, the things that she thought about when, when the bomb went off, which might not be, you know, uh, it was about her kids or the descriptions that she had, the nuances of that experience, as opposed to the sort of headlines of that experience. I think that's kind of important in terms of, in terms of that film. It's, it's, it's the kind of minutia. That, that are really make it kind of more human, I guess. And connecting to the, the human element of that story, I think, is, is, is what I was trying to do. Um, and, you know, I, you know, that's what I have to say. <laughs> One more question, please. Yeah, hi. I have a question uh, for Darren, actually. Why did you pick that topic in particular about indefinite immigration, indefinite detention? It's um, actually, well, I came to it actually through a different story that I'm actually hoping to make now, which I'm working on, which was about um, stowaways, uh, the, the, the stowaway in planes. So in London in 2015, there was a, 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 a gentleman landed on a rooftop in West London who had uh, smuggled himself over in a, a landing gear. And actually, he had died, obviously, but uh, somebody else had survived the same flight in the, in the real world. And so, I was, and so I've been trying to get, kind of investigating and trying to find out who this person was who survived. And one of the first sort of pieces of information I found out about was that once he was released from hospital, he was placed into a detention center called Harmonsworth, which is out by, which is next to Heathrow Airport. There's a, a, there's, there's a couple in Heathrow Airport and the, the detention centers are normally sort of around sort of ports of entry. Um, and stuff like that, although they're sort of hidden in sort of kind of weird sort of places that you would never really think of going. Um, so I found out about Harmsworth. I'd never really heard about Harmsworth before, but it's the biggest uh, detention center in Europe. And, uh, and through trying to find this person that had survived, I, I met a charity called uh, Detention Action who uh, run advocacy groups uh, called Freed Voices, which was uh, a, a group of people that have experienced uh, the detention estate in the UK. And so I started becoming interested in the subject matter. And I think, you know, in terms of VR and what I'm interested in, and I think obviously, you know, and I see obviously Nonny's work, and, and is, is, is giving a voice to people that, you know, kind of giving a voice to, to those that are maybe are marginalized uh, or, or don't have, um, you know, try, trying to kind of bring you into somebody else's world. And I think in terms of immigration, Specifically, and, and immigrants and asylum seekers in the UK, um, you know, it, it, at this time where we are with Brexit and stuff like that, and, and Trump, I think it's. Imp I thought it was important to try and tell a story where you you bring people very much into that world and uh, let them connect to those people instead of seeing them as people often do as 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 just a problem that needs to be dealt with, and uh, and actually having investigated the detention system, it's such a broken system that is, is really not fit for purpose in, in the sense that it's not doing what it's meant to be doing. Uh, it costs a lot of money. 
uh, and and it's and it's harming people. So, uh, so it just it just felt like it felt like a hidden world. And actually, and, and as soon as it felt as soon as I kind of kind of found that, I felt like well, this is a world that I want people to see, and you can't normally see it. And you know, the the, the hardest thing about that film was that, like you can't get into detention centres to film them. So again, having to build a world. Uh, in, in a visual sense, with, without like a main location, and uh, and contributors also that in the main didn't want to be seen on camera, for, for you know through fear of the Home Office really in the UK. So that's how I came to it. Great, Amory, Darren, so so great. Sorry. Yeah. Did you want to just add to that? Yeah, just I just quickly? wanted to add. I think it's a very human thing that we have trouble. Th there's so much information going on, and we're so overloaded with lots of things that it's hard for us to care for something we have not experienced, actually. And, and VR is really helpful for that, because you can actually go through uh, and not only see the point of view, but also experience what people like immigrants go through. And you will care a lot more if it relates to an experience, rather than just watching something on TV. That is just, you know, it, it's just there for one minute. If the subject is long, maybe two minutes, and then it just it's erased by the next commercial about whatever hamburger or something. So, and VR really can have you experience and go through. Then you're going to have a stronger connection because you actually experienced it with your all, all of your senses. So uh, th that's... It's hard to multitask in VR, right? It's a singular <laughs> yeah, experience, exactly. So right? you, you, you have to be. And if it's correctly done, you're drawn into the story and you feel connection with. So Darren and Amory, thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jeff.